the top cop who put his badge on the line for justice. You know the name Doug Papa? Yes, I do. God bless Doug Papa, an honest cop. I was elated, of course, but then as he testified, I was, I was somewhat concerned for him because I knew that they were probably going to crucify that man. Sometimes the truth has a price. That may be the lesson of a Virginia police officer who says, in trying to do the right thing, he ended up paying for it. The message you're sending is, see, we did it, Doug. You don't come out and you don't buck the system. Uh, no matter what the reason is, you just can basically keep your mouth shut. But if I wouldn't do it all over again, I would take the badge and I would leave it on somebody's desk and get out of police work. Because the day I can't tell the truth because somebody's pressuring me, and the day the system doesn't want me to tell the truth because somebody's pressuring me, is the day I'd leave the badge on the desk and walk away. Papa was fired for insubordination. But one man who confronted truth and consequences. From Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Doug Papa, Truth and Consequences Podcast. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 119 of the Truth and Consequences podcast from Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm your host, Doug Papa. It's Thursday, May 26th, 2022. As you all know, I'm an independent investigative journalist, former law enforcement officer, casino executive, some other stuff there between all those years. Listen, before I get to today's podcast... The past two weeks in this country have been terrible. We had the Buffalo mass shooting in Buffalo, New York. Ten people killed, murdered in a supermarket. Then we had yesterday 19 elementary school children and two teachers slaughtered by an 18-year-old kid. Remember, 18-year-old kid from Buffalo also. My heart goes out to the families. That's all I could say. I'm not going to say prayers and God is with you and all the stuff. That's your own to work out with whatever you want. But I'm not going to get into a whole lot in this podcast because I, I got a lot of stuff about the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. But I want to say this. It's absolutely freaking disgusting in this country with these mass shootings. It's bad enough when adults get killed. But when you have children in school that are never coming home to their families because some 18-year-old psychopath, mentally ill person, and that's what he is, with a military-type rifle, went into that school and slaughtered 19 elementary school students and two teachers. And you know what's going to happen in this country, ladies and gentlemen? Absolutely nothing. It's going to happen again. Because nothing is going to happen with the politicians that we have in office on both sides. I'm a Second Amendment defender to a certain point. But something has to be addressed here. Obviously, it's a mental health issue because no normal person is going to murder, whether it was 10 people in Buffalo, 58 people, October 1st, 2017 in Las Vegas, 19 children yesterday and two teachers in Texas. This is a freaking disgrace. And none of the politicians in office can sit down and agree on anything. Something's going to have to be done because this just just can't happen. This is this is a freaking disgrace and it pisses me off to no end. These little kids went to school and they're dead. They're gone. Okay. All the love, all the praying, they're dead. They're not coming back to life. Okay, this needs to be addressed. And I have a problem, and I don't care if anybody gets upset with what I got to say. Okay, I have a problem with an 18 year old kid going into a gun shop and be able to buy a military type AR 15 platform rifle with a high capacity magazine. And then a couple days later, he goes and he slaughters the kids and the teachers at the school. There's something wrong here, and it needs to be addressed. That's all I'm going to say on this podcast. I'll have another podcast on this. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I did two podcasts, several podcasts. The last two podcasts I did, let me get up on the screen here for you to see. This is episode 
Um, this is episode 116 I have up on the screen here. Let me get me back up on the screen here, okay? Uh, I published that on May 5th, 2022, and the title of that episode was Two LVMPD Officers Under Internal Affairs Bureau Investigation. One is LVPPA, which is the police union rep, sources say. And remember from that episode, uh, I said that according to sources who told me, um, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, police officer Ray Ann Armstrong, and John Abel, who's also a, a police union, that's the Las Vegas Police Protective Association, the union for the rank and file, were under investigation. You go back and look at the podcast, I'm not going to rehash the whole thing. Well, after that podcast aired, uh, corrupt, a documented liar, an incompetent, Clark County, Nevada Sheriff Joe Lombardo, who commands the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, and he's a candidate, current candidate for governor of Nevada, ordered a full-scale internal investigation to determine who has been leaking information to me. And sources told me that the Internal Affairs Bureau is under investigation themselves because they believe the sources of the information are coming from the Internal Affairs Bureau. And, um, and then after I aired that episode, let me punch this up on the screen here for a second. Okay, you see that one over there? Okay. And that was episode 118 that I published on May 18, 2022. And it was titled, LVMPD, Criminal Intelligence Section Under Scrutiny. And in that episode, I published uh, a confidential internal memo from the Deputy Chief Sasha Larkin of Homeland Security, who runs the criminal intelligence section, because they're under scrutiny for expenditures. Now, since that podcast was published, I've received more information, um, and then now I understand that criminal intelligence uh, is under investigation too. So is Internal Affairs Bureau investigating the criminal intelligence section? Is the criminal intelligence section investigating the Internal Affairs Bureau? Uh, that's going to be interesting because maybe they'll meet at the middle and say, we're not getting anywhere because that's exactly where they're going to go nowhere with this investigation. Um, but I wish them luck, wish them all the luck in the world. Um, I don't want to waste um, taxpayer money. So good luck with that. Now, why am I talking about it? Because every time the police department and they're going after, they're, I understand they're interviewing cops and none of them, what I heard are any of my sources. Okay. Uh, and I wouldn't tell anybody who my sources were, but not the ones I heard that they're talking about the past couple of days. But with that said, okay, uh, I keep getting information because the more they mess with police officers, the more information I get. And I say that on every podcast. Every time I do a podcast, I got more information coming through the secure pipeline where I get my information from. So with that, um, I'm going to put this guy's picture up on the screen here for a second. Okay, who are we looking at here? Um, that is Captain Michael Gennaro. That's G-E-N-N-A-R-O. And Michael Gennaro is the captain in charge of the Internal Affairs Bureau uh, right now. And they're involved in some of these investigations, and allegedly they're all so being investigated themselves. Now, Mr. Gennaro, Captain Gennaro, okay, a lot of cops familiar with Michael Gennaro. Um, like I said, he heads the Internal Affairs Bureau. Uh, question to me, uh, and this is new information I got recently, is why the hell this guy's running Internal Affairs Because in that position? Because according to what I'm told, he has a questionable history on Metro, and I guess he's been on Metro since like 1998. But uh, why don't you listen to some of this stuff, ladies and gentlemen, because... Some of it sounds a little far-fetched, but remember I said the other day in the podcast, talking about the criminal intelligence section, that I've heard over the years they've done some criminal stuff, stuff that was against the law, things they should have done, and um, we'll talk about more in another podcast, but this is just some of the stuff here that I was told by sources familiar with Michael Gennaro over the years. Now... According to what I was told, I want you to listen to this. Um, back in the day, we're going back like 
in the 90s now, okay, um, 2000, when Bill Young was the sheriff of Clark County, Gennaro was in the criminal intelligence section at that time. And the sergeant, I guess, in there was a gentleman named Will Scott, who's now a retired a captain. Now, according to what sources are telling me, is that uh, when Gennaro and Scott were in criminal intelligence section, then Sheriff Bill Young uh, pulled him in the office. And th- ladies and gentlemen, this is coming from sources. I'm not making this stuff up. Okay? And I'm reading here what, what they're telling me. Um, and Sheriff Young ordered them to break into the hotel suite, which I believe they told me it was at the Palms Hotel Casino at the time, of then Death Row Records, uh, the producer, you remember him, Suge Knight. Okay, Suge Knight, he's now in prison, I think, for, for murder, attempted murder or something. But according to what I was told, Gennaro uh, bragged, to detectives that they were told to do that. And Gennaro, according to sources, said him and Will Scott did do that. They burglarized the hotel room of Shug Knight, who was not in at the time, and they knew that, okay? Now, according to what I was told, both Gennaro and Scott sat there and bragged to other detectives later on that they drank Shug Knight's liquor and smoked his cigars they sat there with their guns out, and came a time when Suge Knight and his entourage returned to the suite. And from what I was told, the way it was described to me, there was sort of a Mexican standoff. Everybody was pulling guns. Um, of course, they identified themselves as Metro detectives. And what I was told was they told Suge Knight and his party, we have a message from our sheriff, basically, get the fuck out of town you're not welcome here. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's what I was told. And I've heard that uh, from other cops uh, for years, even before I started writing you know, for the Bold Post Examiner and, you know, did these podcasts. I've heard that for years. But since this thing started now with this full-blown supposed investigation that's going on, because Lombardo's trying to find out who's been leaking information to me, and cops have been leaking information to me uh, for years. I mean, he knows that. When I did all the stories for the Baltimore Post Examiner uh, that for years, but but he's upset because you know he's running for governor. He's afraid some things are going to come out, and he's also protecting his uh, cohort who's running for sheriff, um, a documented uh, another documented liar and pervert, uh, corrupt former under sheriff uh, Kevin McMahill, retired under sheriff, running for a Clark County sheriff, uh, with two other guys who were running uh, retired assistant sheriff Tom Roberts and retired sergeant of Stan Height. So, um, so anyway, that's what I was told. I, I can imagine this right now. Uh, now, was that, you know, uh, a bravado, uh, bragging? But cops say it happened, and that's the way he related to them, detectives, and, and they told me about it. Um, and one detective said, uh, and he'll explain why he said this to me, okay? Um, the analogy when they discuss Michael Gennaro, was, quote, he knows where the bodies are buried, unquote. And apparently, according to them, Gennaro must have forgotten about all his past misdeeds since now he's the captain of the Internal Affairs Bureau and is investigating uh, cops, okay? So th- this is what sources are telling me. Why did, why did they say that? I hope to God, not really where the bodies buried. That's just using that analogy. But who knows what's what's been going on for for years in this department. Now, like I said, Michael Gennaro was in criminal intelligence, and at some point in time, he got booted out of the criminal intelligence section. Okay, um, according to sources who spoke to me, um, Gennaro went to. I think he was the deputy chief at the time. He's now retired. The uh, guy's name was Rod Jett, G-E-T-T. And when he realized he's getting booted out of criminal intelligence, he went to Rod Jett, and he told them that uh, if they don't put him in the unit where he has a take-home car, he doesn't have to do calls for service, that, according to what I was told, G- 
Gennaro told Rod Jett, if he didn't get a position like that, since he's getting booted out of criminal intelligence, that he was going to go to Action 13 News and tell them all the dirty stuff that was going on in the criminal intelligence section and within Metro. And then I was told, uh, much to the dismay, Michael Gennaro was then transferred into the what's called the repeat the rope unit, which is called the repeat offender program, where they follow repeat offenders, try to catch them in the act, they do all that kind of stuff. And they couldn't figure out why to get booted out of criminal intelligence it is pretty pretty serious. And what and why this guy is now putting into another specialized unit when other people, you know, cops want to get in there. So he went into the rope unit, I think around the end of, uh, I don't know, I got it over here, the date. It's not important, but during his tenure. And um, because he threatened that he was going to unload on all the dirty stuff going on in Metro. And like I said, and he moved up to the rank to sergeant, lieutenant, and is now the captain in charge of internal affairs. Now, according to cops familiar with Michael Gennaro during his tenure in these units, um, they said that when he, when he was in criminal intelligence, he never put in for a vacation slip, and he even bragged about it to other cops. Um, he would just take days off when he wanted, uh, and he had thousands of dollars all the time on his person and never accounted for most of the flash money. That's what it's used for for different undercover operations, from what I'm being told, that he never accounted for it when he was in the intelligence unit. Okay, And even after the unit... Uh, when he went to the rope and, and this stuff, I guess the cops always saw him with, with a lot of money on him, and they were questioning that. So this is what they're telling me, folks. I'm not making this stuff up, okay? I have no reason. I don't know this guy, okay? I, they told me that he's uh, um, a, a former New York City cop, told me he was in some shootout early in his career and left and then came over here to the LVMPD. I'm st- I have people in New York checking on that, and I'll update you in a future podcast. Um now, here's another instance where I guess a bunch of detectives in one of his houses years ago helped him bring in a huge humidor. People don't know what a humidor is. It's one of those um, air-conditioned units that they put cigars in. And they helped him move it into his house. And he bragged that there were, um, I heard everything from upwards of $30,000 worth of cigars in the humidor. Now, um, one of the people told me that they couldn't figure out how a guy on a salary of, of a Metro cop back then could afford, you know, all this money that he always had on him and uh, 30,000 upwards worth of cigars and a humidor. But that went into his house. And I was told um, the other day, one of the people, the sources told me, he says, um, we kind of just figured it out. Um, when you are whining, this is their comments, not mine. When you are whining and dining all of these big wood, big wigs with all these undercover operations and stuff. And he keeps saying, meaning Gennaro, that he doesn't have to account for the money. Well, I guess you can afford it, meaning the cigar collection. That's what the cop told me. Okay. Now, another incident here. There's a lot what they told me on this guy. I'm not going to talk about everything. And let me get this guy's picture up on the screen again. That's him. That's Michael Gennaro, Captain of Internal Affairs. Now, uh, Captain Gennaro, as other cops, I'm on the bottom, I say all the time, if you want to call me up and you want to sit down and do an interview, um, I would sure like to interview you, uh, especially to see what, what you had that you were going to unload to Action 13 about stuff that was going on in the criminal intelligence section in the police department. If, if indeed, if you want to deny it, then you have the right to do that, but you know how you can get in touch with me. Okay, Um, listen, here's another thing. I guess around 2013, 2014, uh, there was a squad Christmas party. And it's my understanding, talking to these sources, that this happened while the squad, and I think it was uh, the repeat offender program squad detectives, they were on duty. Well, Gennaro set up, according to what I was told, Gennaro set up, uh, he was a detective at the time, I believe in the rope unit, set up a Christmas party at the Spearmint Rhino Gentleman's Club here in Las Vegas. It's a, it's a stripper club, topless bar, okay? I've never been in it. I don't know if it's topless. It's topless, bottomless, I don't know. Um, but anyway, Spearmint Rhino Gentleman's Club. And the squad went in there. And they end up getting, and the, 
Uh, this was not an undercover thing. This this was known. These guys were cops when they were in there. Gennaro set it up and got a comp table for the cops. And I heard upwards of $5,000 worth of comp liquor uh, that night that they didn't have to pay for. And there were some strippers there. I understand the, the boys had a good night. They had some fun. Uh, it's like one of the detectives used a phrase to me. Uh, Joseph Wamba's choir boys. I uh, I got nothing on some of the cops in the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. But getting back to this Spearmint Rhino party. So uh, they told me that obviously Gennaro had connections from his days in criminal intelligence and had some connection at the Spearmint Rhino. Uh, and another cop told me, as you do know, that the Spearmint Rhino Club around 2013, 2014 was the territory uh, for prostitution that was run by Jamal Rashid, a.k.a. Molly Mall, who's now in prison. And I talked about that in podcasts, and I got more stuff coming up on that. And there's something else going to happen that it's not for me to say. But something you're going to hear more about uh, Jamal Rashid and the, and the, the corrupt uh, Las Vegas Metro Police Department pimp investigating team from years ago. And that's all I'm going to say on that. But anyway, getting back to this party. So I guess they all had a good time. And um, some of them cops were allegedly messing with the strippers. And this was supposedly on county time um i guess uh there was one of the sergeants that was there and and said later on that Gennaro had three thousand dollars he took out of his own money out of the bank um so anyway th this is troubling if all this indeed is true now why am i saying that now other sources that i spoke to okay have told me now, maybe people are pissed at this guy because he's in charge of maternal affairs, okay? But I've, I've been hearing stuff about this guy for years from, from different cops. So maybe they're pissed at him because he's in internal affairs, and now he's, you know, burning other cops and involved in this investigation, and they're saying, well, what about everything that he did, supposedly, when, when he was doing bad deeds, alleged, alleged bad deeds, according to these police officers? But, uh, you know, so, 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 that, so that's what we have here. But... You know, my thing is this. Other people that I talked to told me, um, and even some of these sources that spoke to me, is that Michael Gennaro was probably one of the best, if not the best, undercover officer uh, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department ever had and did a lot of undercover work, and, and I heard he did a lot of good stuff, okay? And I worked for years, I told you, undercover. And I'll talk about something here at, at the end of the podcast, too, about that, because somebody said something the other day, and I... I got to straighten it out. But, uh, you know, you had to look at it this way. When, when you're in an undercover role, you have, I did it, you have flash money, you hang out with bad guys, you hang out in bars, you hang out in nightclubs. So uh, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. As long as you don't go over the line and get used to that type of lifestyle, and then you start, and I'm not saying it happened in this case, you start um, misappropriating flash money, you get... Uh, 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 you get enamored in this with, with the women and stuff, and then you, you start going over, over the edge. And that's how you become uh, a bad cop. I'm not saying it happened in this case. I'm just saying that that happens. But I did hear that um, he was a good undercover officer. As a matter of fact, somebody told me, and I didn't know this, and I, I researched it in, on, online because his name is mentioned in one or two articles, is that a couple of years ago we had uh, the son of a judge out here who – basically robbed the Bellagio Casino, I think, of a million dollars worth of chips. Anyway, long story short, you can get online and research it, but um, Michael Gennaro, uh, at the time, I think he was in the rope unit still. He was out of criminal intelligence. Um, he volunteered to go undercover and find out where the, the suspect hung out and, and you know, make friends with him because that's what you do in undercover. And I guess it was successful, and he was – Gennaro was the one that actually got – uh, some of the $25,000 chips back and, and made the arrest uh, because of his undercover work. So, you know, and I, you know, and, and I look at it this way, you know, I don't know anything about this guy, but, you know, I mean, you look at him over here, you know, Gennaro's his last name. I'm Italian, okay? He's Italian. People say well, he's a cop in New York. You know, sometimes people put all this stuff together and they say, you know, uh, the guy's probably corrupt, okay? Um, but, you know, because I, I went through that when I was in Loudoun, you know, in Loudoun County, the sheriff's office, and you know, down south. You know, who's this guy from New York coming down here? And, you know, everybody from New York, uh, uh, Goombas, and I heard all that, you know, the, the good old boys and all this type of stuff. But, you know, it wasn't true. So, but anyway, I heard he was a good cop, good undercover cop. So, 
Uh, we have a couple of things in common. I never was a crook. And I'm not saying he was a crooked cop, but I'm just saying I never was. But I'm saying, you know, we were both from New York City. Uh, I worked years undercover, and so did he. So if all this other stuff that they're telling me uh, is true, it is disturbing. And if it's not true, then um, I think, you know, he should come out and, and talk. Like these other cops, I talk, and nobody comes out to talk. So you call up, you leave messages for some of these people, and they never call you back because they're not allowed per department policy to talk, you know, and in, you know, to me, it's, it's, uh, that's, that's the way it is. So anyway, that's a story on Michael. I hope it's not true because, you know, I did hear he was, um, and actually somebody told me the other day, he goes, Doug, he wasn't one of the best undercover cops Metro ever had. He was the best. That's what I was told. And people got to understand something. Um, there are police officers, you know, patrol. They get promoted. They go into detectives' units. They work homicide. They work burglaries. Work property crimes. Okay, but working undercover is a totally separate. It, 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 it's a totally separate thing. Not every cop can work undercover. They don't have uh, the character, the mentality, the smarts uh, to deal with criminals. Um, it's not like you're a detective interviewing a criminal. I did this for years, okay? Uh, you're with them. You're, you're, you, you know, you, you infiltrate them. You go in. You, you want to buy the narcotics. You want to buy the guns, explosives, whatever it is that you're going after, a stolen property. Um, it takes a special kind of police officer uh, to do that kind of work. Um, and it cost me my marriage because um, I was married to the job. So I, I look at this when I hear different things because if, if you haven't worked undercover, and then people hear, well, you know, we always had money on him and this. Well, of course he had money on him. But you work undercover. You have to have flash money. You go out, you know, you're drinking, you go, you go in bars, you buy drinks for people. That's not your own money. So, um, so I'm just bringing that up because undercover assignments, not every cop can work undercover. Some of the greatest people that work in homicide in these other cases, they do great work. But they never want to work undercover, and they can't. They don't. They don't. They don't have what it takes. And, and I'll talk about more of that in in, a, in in another podcast when I get into some of the stuff that I did. Anyway, I hope what these guys are telling me is not true. But if it is, you know, it's it's disturbing um, to say the least. What do I want to talk about now? Okay, like I said, got some more information the other day on Sheriff Lombardo, and. You put this up. I'm going to play this little uh, video over here for a second. Let's see which one is the number seven. Okay. Uh, what are we looking at over here? We're looking at uh, the bottom parts and um, what is it going on here? Okay, there we go over here. Okay. Let me get myself up on the screen here. Number one. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, okay, you saw enough of it. The heck, let me just get myself up off the screen here. Put this over here. Okay, enough of this. Okay, what are we looking at over here? Uh, somebody gave me a tip and said that the Sheriff Lombardo uh, has a business that he owns, technically, run out of his house, and that he hasn't claimed that on his financial disclosures to the Nevada Secretary of State that he has to do because he's running for governor, he's a sheriff, he's running for he's a political person. So, what you just saw on the screen, you can go back and, and, and play it back. Um, you saw the, uh, the bottom part of his financial disclosure that came off the Nevada Secretary of website for 2021 and 2022. And they're, they're both similar. Let me put it back up on the screen here just so a second here so you can see it. Okay? That's, this, that's the other part that I'm going to talk about. Those are the bottom part of the financial. And this came information from a police source. And, of course, I had to verify some stuff you can't verify, you know, but this is one of the things I can verify. So, anyway, on the bottom part of the disclosures for 2021 and 2022, in Section 7, it states uh, business entities. List each business entity, parentheses, example, organizations, enterprises operated for economic gain, including proprietorship, partnership, firm, business, trust, joint venture, syndicate, corporation, or association, with which you or a member of your household is involved as a trustee, beneficiary, director, officer, owner, in whole or in part, limited or general partner, and blah, 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 blah. Okay? So 
this is the document that you just saw on the screen, okay? This is the page here. I'm going to read here. You just saw that on the video. This is from the Secretary of State. And lo and behold, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the, the source was correct. Because in September 10th of 2020, Sheriff Joe Lombardo formed a business called Probable Cause Racing, LLC. It's a domestic limited liability, blah, blah, tongue twisted again, domestic limited liability company. It's not a not-for-profit company. It's a domestic limited liability company. Founded on September 10, 2020. It's active to this day. So it was founded in 2020. And the managing member, and you just saw the thing on the screen, you go back and look at it, is Joseph Michael Lombardo at 9904. <clears throat> so my voice is going. Allegria Drive, Las Vegas. That's why I'm pronouncing it. A L A L E G R I A. That's not that's not private information. You get this off the website. I'm not giving out his address. So his business, Probable Cause Racing LC, is listed at his residence, and he's the managing member. The problem is, ladies and gentlemen, um, what I'm saying, what I'm looking at right now, he filed false financial statements in 2021 and 2022 with the Nevada Secretary of State because he does not list that business on there. Now, I'm not going to get into <clears throat> this whole thing, but there's, uh, and I talked about this, I think, on a podcast uh, some time ago, but this is kind of involved. But according to sources who spoke to me, uh, Sheriff Lombardo uh, committed malfeasance and misfeasance because allegedly what I've been told, and I'm not going to get into the whole thing, is Joe Lombardo was involved in off-road racing for a racing team. I'm not going to get into the whole thing right now. But from what I was told, that he had um, resident officers, officer, working on his off-road vehicles on county time, and this guy was not patrolling and backing up other officers. And, um, and I have the name, I don't have the name with me now in the notes, but it's a former associated Joe Lombardo when he worked in narcotics. And, um, and that's what they're telling me, that that whole thing w was going on for a long time. And Joe Lombardo actually told, when I've been told, the supervisors not to do anything to him. And he was working, I think, out of the gene area, uh, this cop, because uh, it's a resident office area when he's supposed to be working. But he would come to work and just work on fixing and tuning up Joe Lombardo's off-road vehicles. Uh, if that is true, and I got, I got much more on this coming in on this, if that is true, uh, like I said, that makes a case for malfeasance and misfeasance, if it indeed is true. And I got cops' names that are involved in this. They're on my other notes and stuff. So, so that's what we got going on over there. And that came in the other day uh, from a police source. And like I said, that's what I confirmed. So from, from what I'm looking at here, um, he lied, falsified those two disclosures because the company is active and it comes back to his home address and he's a managing member and he didn't disclose it but for whatever reason. And, but they said there's, there's more to this, ladies and gentlemen, there's, there's more to this, like I said, but we'll get to that in another podcast. Okay. I don't have anything. Oh yeah. I'm going to mention this too. But I just found this out. Remember, I think it was the last podcast or the, was the last one I did. I mentioned former Las Vegas Metro police officer, Rachel Sorkow. That was the, uh, uh, the one that was arrested uh, and ch charged with one felony and everything else was dropped and you know, all this stuff with taking pictures of people and their privates and everything. She's a convicted felon. Um, she's no longer a cop. But uh, a source told me the other day, and I verified this, is that um, I verified it. I looked at marriage license. Um, she was on probation for 18 months starting around February 2020. She's still a convicted felon. But on September 14th or September of 2021, she married a Metro police officer, a guy by the name of Juan Astorga, who's a Metro cop from what I was told. So people are saying like, hey, you know, you, there's a policy, I guess, in the police department that you can't associate with people of ill repute, convicted felons, but this cop married her, okay? And the, the marriage license does show uh, that they got married on September of 2021. So how does that get out? Because I guess they were telling me about some other stuff that was going on with other cops who got jammed up uh, because people in their families, sisters, somebody with this one guy who was, uh, was married to like a felon or something, and this guy didn't even know it, and they came after him. But they're saying, well, how, how can this cop, you know, be married to a convicted felon? Uh, his wife, ex-cop, you know, and she was divulging all, allegedly all this information from the scope system. Go back in the other podcast and look at it. 
So they told me about it. I checked it, and that appears to be true. Um, cops are still telling me this is. I'm not. I don't have it up on the input, but it is, is on the. And I'll have the. I'll have the links to everything I talk about. If it involves another story, a podcast, like I always do. But I talked about this in one of the other podcasts. This is Kevin McMahill's bio. His bio from the police department, and like I said in the other podcast. Okay, he's missing about two years. He doesn't explain here. Okay, and remember, one of the podcasts back, I said in 2014. And I had it up on the screen, but I don't have it up on the screen now. Um, Kevin McMahill told uh, then Sergeant uh, or or uh, what was his name Norm John that um, I worked at Metro, left to work in my hometown of Denver, and came back two years later. And he's saying people were confusing that with with the with the uh, the incident with um, Carrie Lance, the exposing when he got sustained on charges, and those charges are sustained uh, of. Conduct on becoming an officer, um, neglect of duty, and being untruthful. He failed a polygraph. Those charges were sustained. He was never cleared. He wasn't fired, but he was never cleared. So, but he says in that memo, and other people have told me, he's missing about two years' worth of time. So, ladies and gentlemen, Kevin McMahill's running for Clark County, Nevada Sheriff. He wants to run the Las Vegas Metro Police Department. There's uh, talk out there, and I'm still checking on it, that he also, when he went back, was working for the Denver Police Department for, for a period of time. Um, he doesn't list any of that on his bio. It's complete. It starts out in 1990, 1990 and it goes all the way up to when he retired, uh, and there's, he doesn't mention it. He's not talking about it. I also heard his brother was once a Metro cop, and I haven't verified that yet. I'm still doing my checking, and I heard some things about that, so I'm checking on that. But this is, this is ladies and gentlemen, the man wants to be the highest law enforcement officer in Clark County, Nevada. He needs to explain to the public okay, why he left the police department for two years, okay, before, allegedly, the Carrie Lance incident happened in 1995, and what he was doing during that period of time, he was on the police department, why he left, and why he returned to Las Vegas to get back on the police department. He does not talk about it, and we need to know why, okay? I, as a citizen, want to know why. If he wants to run the police department, we need to know that make sure there's not something that he's hiding. He's obviously hiding the two years gone, but that needs to be explained. So um, that's just the way it is, okay? Um, don't get bent out of shape to me. I'm not the one that was gone for two years. You know, uh, it was Kevin McMahill, and he's not explaining it. I got more stuff I just, uh, I'm going to talk about here in a second. But uh, I want to mention this too. Get this up on the screen here. This was um, episode eight. Okay, just real fast. Okay. This was uh, episode 59 from August 9, 2021, and um, it was titled uh, Las Vegas Massacre, FBI, LVMPD, MGMRI, which is MGM Resorts National, new sniper attack posed a threat prior to 2017. I'm not going to go into the whole thing. I'll have the link again to that. Uh, I see it got like 100 more views one day after I did this talk about it the other day. And um, what I said in, in uh, the other day, and I said in that and people came back to me, you know, there's like news people want to know this stuff. I mentioned in that podcast when I was doing it that uh, I'm showing you a screenshot of an internal police memo that I got that verified that this training did take place. And go back and watch this video. It's only 45 minutes long. But with the input didn't come up on the video, so I didn't display um, the memo. So people want to see the memo. So this memo is going to go up on the screen now. This is the memo that I talked about in 59. I talked about it uh, the other day. And it's, um, this was a confidential police memo that I obtained a couple of years ago after I wrote the first story for the Baltimore um, Post-Examiner. So you see it, go back, you can free shot it, take pictures of it. And it was from Dean Hennessy, sent on Monday, September 19, 2021 at 4.09 p.m. Uh, to Todd Fasulo, who was then a captain. And that's the buddy of... Uh, you want me to talk about him, of uh, Kevin McMahill, now retired assistant sheriff, Todd Fasulo. At that time, September 19, 2011, he was a captain. And Dean Hennessy is writing this memo to him, subject, scenario. Captain, we are having a large-scale MACTAC SWAT scenario at the Sahara Hotel and Casino on Wednesday the 21st. We just wanted to let you know um, so you could post this along to your troops. 
pass this along to your troops. If you have any questions, please contact me at blah, 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 and I will be, uh, you know, get back with your answers. Thanks, Dean. Signed, Dean Hennessy, Alternate Police Operations Planning, APOP, comma, MACTAC, um, Support Operations Bureau, Las Vegas Metro Police Department. Now, uh, some people wanted to see this because I, when I did the podcast 59, uh, I think I did that in 2021, I, I said it's coming up on the screen and it didn't come up. I couldn't hit it for some reason. It wasn't showing. So they wanted to see the actual memo. You know, people, let me tell you something, people. Nothing I do, even when I work with I, I, you know, everything that I say comes from police sources or it's backed up by documents or sometimes it's backed up by documents that I can't show or discuss because it would actually divulge the source of the information. So sometimes I, I talk about stuff that I already have documentation on that backs up what I say, okay? So but this thing, I, it, I, I was supposed to post it. It didn't come up on the screen when I was hitting it, and people wanted to see it the other day, want to see the actual memo. So you got it. Go back and backtrack. You know, um, let me put it back up on the screen here for a second so you see it. Uh, that's the memo. It's got my watermark on. So, and the, the, that was the, the training they did with uh, taking out the, the, the mannequins and the, the silhouettes, uh, simulating a, uh, a sniper attack from an elevated position in a hotel high rise or on top of a garage. And that was before the massacre. So when they say they, they didn't know that this, was, this could happen, it was probable they did because they trained for it. The SWAT team, and I go back and listen, I'm not going to talk. It's a 45 minute video. Anyway, so that's the, the, the memo, the confidential memo that everybody wanted to see the memo. People think like I say this stuff and like I'm making it up. I, ladies and gentlemen, I don't have to make nothing up. Like I said, okay, I don't, I don't have to do these podcasts. It does not sustain uh, my life. You know, I don't, I don't make any income from, from these things. Every now and then somebody throws a couple of bucks in a PayPal account, but I don't make any income from this stuff. It's, it's, it's what I do. Because, frankly, um, nobody else in Las Vegas is doing it because they don't have the police sources that are giving me this information. They give it to me because they've told me over the years they have given reporters out here, police in, have given reports on some good stuff. They didn't do anything on it. They just blow them off. So I don't blow anybody off, okay? Uh, they're public officials. They're public officers. The public has a right to know what's going on in their police department with their police officers, with their police officials, with the sheriffs, the undersheriffs, because they are work for the public and they have a right to know. So when I get this information, I put it out. You know, sometimes I can't corroborate as much as I want to for certain reasons, and sometimes I do, and I show it on my podcast. Now, another thing over here. Let me talk about this. I got more stuff on Lombardo. I just came in the other day. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and I did a podcast, and I mentioned this in a podcast uh, sometime back, and I'll, I'll do it again. But Jamie Frost is a civilian. She's an attorney. She runs the director. She runs the Office of Labor Relations. And I guess cops are still telling me, as they did when I mentioned back then, that um, she meddles into um, internal affairs bureau investigations and dictates how she thinks they should go. And that is not her job. She's, she's in the Office of Labor Relations. I'm, I'll get into this because I have more stuff that I mentioned in another podcast. I'll put this all together in one podcast. But anyway, I just heard the other day that that supposedly was going on. But you know, one, one of the sources told me, that, um, and this is high ranking to us, okay, this is not just the guy at the bottom, um, that when Kelly McMahill is the wife, still the wife of, Kev, um, Kev, Kelly McMahill was the wife of Kevin McMahill. He was the undersheriff. Like I told you, a lot of, lot of uh, nepotism on that department. It's unbelievable. But anyway, at one point in time in her career, she's now retired. She retired as a deputy chief. But Captain Kelly McMahill at the time was in charge one time with the Eternal Affairs Bureau. And I guess Jamie Frost was inserting herself into meetings uh, with the Internal Affairs Bureau that, that concerned ongoing investigations, which Frost has no business being in those things. And Kelly Mayle actually threw her out. And, and I was told you know, she threw her out of the meeting and said, you have no business being involved in active IB investigations. Basically, get the hell out. Get out. And she did. But I was told that after Kelly got promoted and moved out of Internal Affairs, there was a captain named Fred Haas that came in. H-A-A-S, and he took over internal affairs after Kelly McMahill, and I was told that um, Jamie Frost ran right over him. She was basically running the whole internal affairs bureau operation from the Office of Labor Relations, which is a totally separate thing. So anyway, I heard that that still may be going on, is what they're telling me. 
So they were upset about it. I also heard the other day, um, I recently informed, okay, that someone in the Office of Labor Relations uh, had an Eternal Affairs Bureau complaint filed against them for discourtesy. So that's what my sources are telling me. They get more on that. I will let you know. Now, we're 45 minutes, and uh, allergies aren't too bad. Got the air conditioning on. In one of the podcasts, I think I mentioned that sources told me that Sheriff Lombardo is a bigot and a racist. Um, and I mentioned that he, uh, people have heard him many times use the N word and describe what I, and I said in that podcast, I never heard the word mud shark, which he just, he, he calls, uh, white females who date a black men, according to my sources. This is what they tell me people that know him. Okay. Over the years and work with them. Okay. Um, that he's a racist. That's what they tell me. So recently I received this information. Okay. Now this is what they tell me. Um, back in 2017, the Rio Hotel, All Suites Hotel and Casino here in Las Vegas, the security staff had taken Sheriff Lombardo's daughter, Morgan Freeman, excuse me, Morgan, Morgan Freeman, Morgan Lombardo into custody for trying to rent a room with the fake Alabama driver's license uh, with her boyfriend. A Lombardo's daughter, when this happened, was accompanied by a black male adult who also had a fake driver's license. And that was the, the gentleman, she was a her boyfriend. You know, she's white, he's black. And according to what sources told me, um, it's, again, different sources here, commonly known that Sheriff Joe Lombardo is a racist specifically regarding African Americans. Uh, and then personnel have been in his presence when he has used the term N-I-G-G-E-R and mudshark, which is him describing a white female who's with a black male. Well, it's his daughter, a black boyfriend. Okay, is that what he thinks of his daughter? But that's my opinion. But let's stick to what I was told. A source has said, when this incident happened in 2017, um, a contact was made with Sheriff Lombardo, uh, who responded to the Rio Hotel, uh, angry that his daughter had been taken into custody by the security hotel staff. Uh, I was told that at the time, Morgan Lombardo was a college student in Colorado, and she came to Vegas uh, with her boyfriend or met up with him here because the boyfriend was black, and cops told me that he's like a nice guy. I don't know if she's still going out. Let me, let me stick to what they're telling me before I start inserting stuff that I don't know about, okay? So she came to Vegas uh, with a boyfriend and tried to rent the room. They tried to rent the room at the Rio Hotel, and both of them, I guess, had the counterfeit Alabama driver's licenses, security uh, you know, got involved because they, you know, they went to the front desk and they knew the. So anyway, let me stop going to the security stuff here. Apparently, Sheriff Lombardo was unaware his daughter was in town, as she wanted to come to Vegas. From what I was told, without her father knowing, because he disapproved of her quote black boyfriend. I was told that uh, when Sheriff Lombardo arrived at the Rio Hotel, he was driving his unmarked police Ford Explorer department vehicle. And he had an odor of alcohol uh, on his breath about his presence. Um, and Sheriff Lombardo, from what I was told, uh, was cussing at one of the police supervisors because he was upset about what was going on. Anyway, long story short, from what I was told, the Rio security explained that due to this being the sheriff's daughter, uh, because uh, she had informed the security officers of who her father was uh, prior to the police arriving, and Rio security said they did not want to pursue any charges. So, uh, and it's my understanding, what do I got over here? Uh, Captain, Deputy Chief, Sergeant, and numerous officers uh, were involved in this that night, and then other people knew about it later on. So, that there it is, ladies and gentlemen. That's an update to what I mentioned in the other podcast. Now, I'm going to say something. We're going to shut this thing down here in a couple of minutes because I'm all stuffed up. Um, I don't want to read this, Okay. I did a podcast back, you know, and when I talk about, uh, I talk about the, the undercover operation I did with the FBI, reference to the DuPont kidnapping, and then um, I did another podcast about the, the gambler, Robert Cipriani, go back and look at it, and then in that podcast, I, I got a hold of a memo where the, the U.S. attorney acknowledged his participation in helping them with the, with the case back then, and I got all these emails from people like, well, the U.S. attorney wouldn't write a letter like that. 
you know, they wouldn't, and, and they do, okay? And then, so I figured I'd, I'd read this, okay? Because uh, it goes to that, and it goes to about, and I'm going to talk more about this DuPont kidnapping undercover operation when I infiltrated this group, but I want to get something up on the screen here because it goes to the other podcasts when people say, well, the U.S. attorney wouldn't write a letter on the guy's behalf. Um, well, yeah, you do. you got to count for your time, especially if you're looking for a job, you know, and what you did and stuff. So anyway, let me get this up on the screen here. Um, I'll tell you what this is here in a second. Okay. This is, let me get the banner off here for a minute so you can see it full screen here. Okay. This is a, uh, an article. You can go back and freeze it and, and read it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to read it, but, uh, that is an article. Okay. And on the bottom there, you can see the article highlighted in yellow. It says, um, a former narcotics detective, Doug Papa, uh, infiltrated the group for the FBI. And I, I explained that a little in the other podcast, but that is a, uh, Leesburg today doesn't exist anymore from 1992. After I concluded my undercover operation for the FBI, uh, that's them, uh, on the left hand side, FBI agents, uh, locking up, uh, the ex cop, uh, ex Lieutenant, um, who was part of this operation and they lock him up in Lovettsville, Virginia. And if you look to the right hand side over there, you see the guy in handcuffs and that's another guy from upstate New York and the guy in the white pants, just so you know, the FBI agent with the, the baseball hat on, um, that's, um, let me get back on the screen. You go back and look at it. Okay. That is, uh, then FBI agent Brad Garrett. And just so you know, you, Brad Garrett now, you know, we all get older in life. I'm older. I don't look like I did back then, but Brad Garrett now is a legal consultant. He's a retired FBI agent for ABC News. I just saw him again last night on the news talking about the massacre and stuff. So that was the uh, undercover operation uh, that I was involved in with the FBI. Now, I'm talking about letters from U.S. attorneys. So I'm going to get the first page on. I don't have the second page on, but I'll read it. I'm going to read this over here. So, okay. No, that's not it. We don't want that one. That's the uh, corrupt sheriff Lombardo. That's his falsification, it looks like, of the financial disclosure. Um, we want the Lizer letter right over here. Okay, and I'm going to, that's the first page. And I'm going to take it off, put me back on, go back and free shot and blow it up. Okay, and it's, it's titled U.S. Department of Justice, United States Attorney, Eastern District of Virginia. It's got their phone numbers. It's dated June 10th, 1994, uh, to Douglas Papa, uh, and to whom it may concern, because I had to count for things that I did, you know, because I was still looking for other work. Um, and this is from the US, uh, assistant U.S. attorney. I am an assistant United States attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia and have been a prosecutor since 1975. During those years, I have had the pleasure and honor of working with a large number of federal, state, and local law enforcement officers. I believe that my experience as a prosecutor, as well as my contact with law enforcement personnel, gives me a good insight into the qualities that are necessary to be an effective law enforcement officer. In 1992, I was assigned a case that involved the proactive investigation of a group of men who were plotting to kidnap an heir to the DuPont fortune. Due to a unique set of circumstances at the time, Doug Papa was in a position to be made aware of this kidnapping scheme. He immediately reported his knowledge to the Federal Bureau of Investigation and was asked to work with them as a cooperating individual. This was no small request since it demanded some degree of risk and a considerable amount of time by Mr. Papa. Nonetheless, Doug never hesitated, never once hesitated, to commit himself to this investigation. As a result, court-authored wiretaps were installed, and the investigation was brought to a successful, successful conclusion. As a result of that case, I got to know Doug Papa both professionally and as an individual. I can say without any hesitation whatsoever that Doug is one of the most scrupulous law enforcement officers I have ever met. Time and again, he has stepped forward to do the right thing, quote unquote, even when it was not in his best interest to do, to do so. Doug is a man of many qualities 
as well as a professional, effective, and successful law enforcement officer. His integrity and honesty are beyond reproach. I would be proud to work with him on any investigation slash prosecution. I know that he would work tirelessly, professionally, and very effectively on any case to which he was assigned. Doug is truly a talented, gifted law enforcement officer who, in my opinion, would complement the staff of any police department or law enforcement agency. I would be happy, more than happy, to further discuss Doug Papa with any interested party I could reach at the United States Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Virginia at telephone number blah, blah, blah. Sincerely, Lawrence J. Lizer, Assistant United States Attorney. Now, even with that, ladies and gentlemen, after I was fired from the police department in 1992, that's when I got involved in this undercover operation because I was approached by a lieutenant on the, on the sheriff's office uh, who was involved in this, and that's, that's how I got involved. And I'll talk more about it because it was a pretty involved case. But uh, I made 60 hours of, of uh, uh, consensual body wire um, uh, and transmitter recordings. I think they had 100 hours of Title III recordings on there. It's a pretty interesting case, and, 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 and how it turned out is even more interesting. But, um, but even with this letter, ladies and gentlemen, is like I said, um, I testified in court that the sheriff's office and the prosecutor's office withheld exculpatory evidence in the case of William Douglas Carter. And he was released uh, from prison. He was given a new trial in the summer of 1992. He was found not guilty. And because of what I did is crossing the blue wall of silence, whatever you want to call it, I could never get back on a police department, even with this letter from, from the assistant United States attorney in a, a recommendation like that, which was an excellent recommendation. But because once you come out and you cross that blue wall of silence and you go against a police department. Um, if your career isn't done immediately, you're ostracized, you will never be promoted, people are forced out of the department. It happens all the time in the United States. And it happened to me back in 1992. And I could never get back into police work, or the job that I loved. And that's how I, the long story, we'll talk about that in the podcast, how I ended up coming out here in Las Vegas. So anyway, th th you know, this is a nice letter. But, you know, I'm coming to the end of my, I'm 67 years old, I'm coming to the end of my life, I'm not starting a career. But when I did this, you know, it was in my 40s, this was, you know, what, 30 years ago, okay? And um, could never get back on a police department again, and I tried. You know, once they find out that of what you did is your poison, you know, it, your poison, they want nothing to do with you. So, uh, that that's the way it is, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, listen, uh, 57 minutes. Uh, we're going to shut this down. I got so much more coming out. Um, just so you know, I got, I'm going to have to do another episode. I watched the, the, the governor's debate from 8 News Now last night. Um, Lombardo was in there with the other gentleman running. Uh, Lombardo's a freaking liar, okay? Um, he's a dirtbag. He has no business being sheriff. He has no business certainly thinking he's he's capable of running uh, the state of Nevada. Um, you know, I, 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 you know I'm, I'm voting in the primaries. Uh, in three weeks, I'm voting for somebody. It's not going to be Joe Lombardo. Um, and, um, and I don't care who, whether who wins the primary, but if it's Joe Lombardo, I'm not voting for Joe Lombardo for governor. Okay. This guy, and I said, is a documented liar. He's corrupt and he's freaking incompetent. And I've proved that time and again, and you got to wait till more stuff that's coming out between now and the, the we have five years of the, uh, October 1st, a massacre coming up this October. And there's more stuff coming out from, from other sources on that also, but uh, he even lied last night, and then I saw Dean Heller turn around, the former senator, and said three times, uh, he's lying about something they were talking about. And you go watch it, so it's 8 News Now, it was the governor's debate, it's on. It's online, so you get it on the internet, and Heller said to him, he's lying, he's lying right now, he's a liar. He is. He's a documented freaking liar. So is the guy that he's endorsing, that came up in the debate too. And he said, let's not, Kevin McMahon was cleared. He's a freaking liar, okay? Kevin McMahon wasn't cleared of jack shit, ladies and gentlemen. If Kevin McMahill and Joe Lombardo have police documents to prove that everything I said in five podcasts about this is not true, then why the hell don't they come out and show it? He has nothing. Neither does McMahill. You know damn well Kevin McMahill has all this documentation from 27 years ago because that happened to him. It's probably in his files. Okay? He doesn't want to show it because it's not going to exonerate. It didn't exon he was not exonerated of anything. He was not fired. I'm going to explain to that in another podcast why I heard from sources why that was. But Kevin McMahill was sustained on the charges 
of neglect of duty, conduct on becoming an officer, he failed a polygraph, he was untruthful. And his BS excuse that I'm Irish and my things, my motions are on my sleeve, he's a freaking liar, okay? He's just as corrupt at Lombardo. He covered up everything Lombardo wanted to cover up. Uh, he has no business running for sheriff. And this department is going to be worse off if Kevin McMahill gets in as sheriff. There's two other people running, okay? Tom Roberts, who, who I like, okay, is, um, retired. Let me get this right because I keep screwing up when I say this. Tom Roberts is a retired assistant sheriff from the Las Vegas Metro Police Department. That is Kevin McMahill's opponent, along with Stan Height, a 30-year member, retired sergeant. So there's two other guys running. Kevin McMahill is the dirtbag, okay? Um, and I got more stuff coming out on this guy. He's a documented liar, and I've proved it, okay? He had no respect for the 58 people, and now 60, who died from their injuries, who were killed by Paddock when he went on television in 2018 on a documentary to make himself and the department look good and lied to the American public of when the shooting stopped. He lied his ass off. And none of the news out here, not even Fox News, it's not, excuse me, Fox News, I'm getting tongue-tied, uh, picked that up and did any of the follow-up, any of the stories that I did. He is a documented freaking liar on that and many other things. And I've proved it with both him and Lovato time and again. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's, uh, what time are we at? Oh, it's, it's early. It's uh, 1457 hours. We're in um, Las Vegas. And... Uh, my name is Doug Papa. You've been listening to the Truth and Consequences podcast uh, from Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, remember, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, hit the red subscribe button. If not, audio podcast, the big one, Spotify, iHeartRadio. If you can, support my independent investigative journalism at uh, paypal.me backslash Doug Papa. We'll see you on the next episode. Uh, thanks for listening. And remember, you will not hear these stories in the Las Vegas media, okay? Only on the Truth and Consequences podcast with, with Doug Papa. Uh, thanks for listening, ladies and gentlemen.